Hi, I'm Jeannie. And I'm Danny. And, and we, we are Beauties and the Podcast. Hi, welcome back to Beauties and the Podcast. This week we are discussing Walt Disney's 1959 princess classic, Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty was produced by Walt Disney based on Sleeping Beauty by Charles Perrault. It is the 16th Disney animated feature film. It was released to theaters on January 29th, 1959 by Buena Vista Distribution. This was the last Disney adaptation of a fairy tale for some years because of its initial mixed critical reception and underperformance at the box office. The studio did not return to the genre until 30 years later, which was after Walt Disney had died in 1966, with the release of The Little Mermaid in 1989. This movie fel- features the voices of Mary Costa, Eleanor Audley, Verna Felton, Barbara Luddy, Barbara Jo Allen, Billy Shirley, Bill Shirley, Taylor Holmes, and Bill Thompson. The film was directed by Les Clark, Eric La- La- Larson, ooh, and Wolfgang Reitherman under the supervision of Clyde Jernami, with additional story work by Joe... Joe, Wow, (laughs) I cannot talk right now. On twisters. I wasted all my words on the other two films. Uh, Joe Rinaldi, Winston Hibbler, Bill Pete, Ted Sears, Ralph Wright, and Milt Banta. However, unlike the previous feature films, this was the first Disney feature film that did not have the same background animation material, but instead it had a new background animation material. Sleeping Beauty was the first animated film to be photographed in the Super Technorama 70 widescreen process, as well as the second full-length film animated feature to be filmed in anamorphic widescreen, following Disney's Lady and the Tramp four years earlier. The film was presented in Super Technorama 70 and six-channel stereophonic sound in the first run engagements. And now, on to the movie breakdown. The movie starts with the song Once Upon a Dream with the main title. It's the main title version, so there's no lyrics, just the song. Mm -hmm. We see the title and the opening credits against a colorful background with filigree and symbols and patterns that are of royalty. We then see a cover of the book, which says Sleeping Beauty on it. It's gold and bejeweled. So pretty. So pretty. What was the other one that did that? Was it Cinderella or Snow White or both? Snow White had a book. It it reminded me. I want to say Cinderella might have had a book, but I know Snow White for sure had a book. I think they both did. And Pinocchio. Oh, true. Pinocchio had the wooden book. That's true. As it opens, we hear the the narrator tell us about a faraway land long ago with a king, who is King Stephen, and his fair queen, who is Queen Leah. Many years they had longed for a child, and finally their wish was granted. They welcomed a daughter, Princess Aurora. They named her after the dawn, for she filled their lives with sunshine. A holiday was proclaimed to pay homage to the princess. This is where the story begins on that joyful day, and we hear Hail to the Princess Aurora playing. We see knights of many different colors and people holding different flags coming to the castle. At her christening, Aurora is betrothed to Prince Philip, the son of King Stephen's closest friend, King Hubert, to unite their kingdoms. Prince Philip looks to be about seven or eight years old. Mm -hmm. And is very, he's partial to meeting the baby princess. Mm -hmm. Like, he goes over to her and he's just like, puts up the one side of his mouth, like, ooh, I don't want that. Among the guests are the three good fairies. They are announced when they enter Flora, who is in red, Fauna, who is in green, and Meriwether, who is in blue. Flora and Fauna. Bless Aurora with beauty and song. We see beautiful colors 
what looks like a galaxy mm-hmm. for Flora to start off, and then it shows a beautiful red rose, and then Aurora, what she will look like when she is older. Mm-hmm. For Fauna, we see another galaxy, slightly different. We see colorful birds silhouetted against it, and an outline of a castle, and the silhouette of the princess on the castle. The gifts of beauty and song play during this time. Meriwether's gift, however, is interrupted (laughs) by the evil fairy Maleficent, who is angry and insulted she was not invited. So, Understandable. 100%. I never saw her as a fairy. I thought she was just a witch. She looks like a witch. Yeah, I thought she was more of a witch. But I'm like, why wouldn't you at least extend an invite? Whether you, you know, I mean, if that's all she's really mad about at this point, you should have extended an invite. Right. There's no backstory of why. I mean, Correct. she she clearly is evil, but, you know. Yeah. As retaliation, Maleficent curses the princess, proclaiming Aurora will grow in grace and beauty, but before the sun sets on her 16th birthday, she will prick her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel and die. The music becomes dramatic and scary. The king orders her to be seized, but she disappears as they about to reach her and grab her. The king and the queen queen beg the fairies to undo the curse, but they are not powerful enough. Meriwether uses her magic to weaken the curse, however, so instead of dying, Aurora will fall into a deep slumber, only broken by true love's kiss. We see a galaxy again like the other two fairies, and a sleeping Aurora floating onto the clouds. King Stefan orders all spinning wheels throughout the kingdom to be burned. He yeah. doesn't, he's like pre gaming. He's like, there is no chance this nope. is happening. We're burning everything. You're done. So apparently nobody's allowed to like spin anything for, you know, at least 16 years. And they have a huge bonfire in the uh-huh. middle of the courtyard, like stacked up high. Never mind that she's magic. Who? Oh, Maleficent? Yeah. Yeah, no. And she can just make her own new uh, yeah. spinning wheel? Mm-mm. Yeah, I mean, she can appear and disappear at will. and Right. <laughs> so the fairies sit down together to have tea and figure out a way to help the king and the queen. Flora comes up with an idea, but before she tells the others, they make themselves small and hide within a case because you don't know who's listening. Everything's at ears. I love that, that part in the movie. I love that scene. I love how they just are like... Whoop! And then Mm -hmm. they make themselves small, and they're Mm -hmm. so cute in their little teacup stuff. Adorbs. Flora thinks of turning Aurora into a flower, but then realizes that Maleficent will send a frost and ruin it. Yeah, she kill her that way. (laughs) Fauna's like, she always ruins your nicest flowers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> then Flora thinks about taking Princess Aurora to the, the woodcutter's cottage. So Flora kind of is the leader in she's, that sense. She's got more brains. Yeah, than, she kind of comes like, up with Mary more plans. Weather, and, by this point, she's mad. She's thinking with emotions, and she's eating her feelings. Yep. And... I mean, Fauna is just kind of... She's so sweet. And she's a like bless a your heart kind of. She's a little mouse. She is. Yeah. So it's... Flora thinks of a second plan and is like, okay, we'll, there's an abandoned woodcutter's cottage. We'll mm-hmm. take her there and we will become peasant women ourselves and raise her in the cottage in the forest. The way she says it, it's just like, what do you think of three peasant women? They're like, that's a great idea. Where are you going to find they? them? Yeah. Oh, look in the mirror. And then she changes them to look like peasants instead of They're fairies. They're us. Fauna is super excited about it. She just wants to raise a little baby and bring warms her heart. She loves it so much. Meriwether is doubtful. Well, she was all for it until... Because Flora's like, you can't have music, you, or magic, you can't have wings. Yep, and then Meriwether's like, what? We can't live without magic. We can't magic do that? For 16 years. And Flora's like, if humans can do it, that we can do it. Yeah. So, the fairies run off to tell the king and the queen, which much, with much urging, they reluctantly allow Aurora to live with the fairies hidden in the cottage in the forest. They run off the fairies with the baby in the middle of the night. It's mm-hmm. like a dramatic little scene of them sneaking mm-hmm. out of the castle. The king and the queen are very sad for many years, but as it gets closer to her 16th birthday, the whole kingdom is starting to get excited. Yep. They still have to be careful, though, because Maleficent 
is still angry and won't be satisfied unless her curse actually comes true. So then we are at Maleficent's castle and we see her. She's angry that her henchmen have not found Aurora yet. They claim to have looked everywhere. But then she realizes that they've been looking for a baby this whole time. Yeah, I think he's like, yeah, we've looked in all the cradles. Like, cradles? And he's so proud that he's... He's so <laughs> proud. Yeah. He, what have you been looking for? Like, a baby. <laughs> it's been 16 years. She's not a baby still. <laughs> Idiots. She gets <sighs> so mad. She tells her pet raven and she's like... They've been looking for a baby. Starts <laughs> laughing, evil laughing. The, her men start laughing too because yeah. they think it's just a funny joke. And then she's like, fools! <laughs> Idiots! Imbeciles! She's so angry and they run away from her in fear. I love that. I love that scene too. Yep. This whole movie is one of my favorites. So There's good. a lot of great insults in this. Yes, I love this film. Movie. So she sends her pet raven to look far. It's a crow. It's a raven. It's a crow. To look far and wide for a maid of 16 with hair of sunshine gold and lips as red as a rose. We can see the cottage now in the woods and we hear Aurora, who has been renamed Briar Rose, singing as she cleans. She has grown into a beautiful young woman. On this day, she is turning 16. The fairies have planned a party, or are about to plan a party, <laughs> and have something extra surprise for her. So they want to make her a beautiful dress. Mary, we- they send her off to go pick more berries, even though she's like, I picked them yesterday. Which night. her face is like, I totally know you're doing something. Right, like, you're just very confused. You just want me out of the house. Yeah, you're, you're up something. to something. Yep, she knows. So they send her off. <laughs> they start planning. They're going to make her a beautiful dress. Meriwether wants it blue. Flora wants it pink. The battle now begins. This is the, the Love pink, it. pink Love blue, it. Pink this blue like dress battle. Favorite. They want her out of the house, like I said, so they send her away. And the three fairies start right away to make things. Meriwether wants to use magic, but the other two say, no, it's not safe. It's Even though it's their 16th birthday, we, we still, we mm-hmm. have to be so careful. And then they're, so, of course, Meriwether is, like, whining. She's like, we have to actually do work. What? A big work. We don't A know birthday how, party. Like we me. don't know how to do any of this. Yeah. And she's like... Fauna's gonna make the cake. And she's like, Mary Mother's like, you can't make a cake. You don't know how to make a cake. And she's like, but she's always wanted to. Just let her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then Flora's like, I'm making the dress. And Mary Mother is. <laughs> she starts saying something. And Flora's just like, and you'll be the dummy. You're the dummy. Oh my God. So many insults. So I love it. <clears throat> Flora uses. Uh, Meriwether as the dummy to make the dress <laughs> and it's hysterical to watch them make the dress and the cake again such great scenes in this movie oh, yeah. I can't Love even it. tell you <laughs> so Fauna my girl does not know how to cook feel ya reads the directions girl. and it says to fold in eggs <laughs> girl I get you I want- I'm there right there with you she folds in full eggs with the shell into the batter like she's tucking them into bed. <laughs> I want to make this cake so bad. <gasps> Me too. Like, but mine's gonna actually look like hers. Yeah. It's gonna be a hot mess, and yours is gonna look super and... cute. Yeah. So <gasps> it's so cute, like just the imagery of her folding them in. Adorbs. And Flora is making the dress. Mary Weather is going to be the dummy, <laughs> and she is not happy about it. So she comments saying. This dress looks awful. <laughs> My favorite. And Flora responds, that's because it's on you, dear. <laughs> favorite Best line. line ever. Favorite line. That's because it's on you, dear. <laughs> Love it. Well, it doesn't help that Mary Weather is very wearing a very poofy dress. So yeah, it looks horrible because And she's short. She's is, a little short, well, chubby little fairy. And, and so they're comparing. I've noticed this. And I've noticed it in the past, but it really stuck out this time. They're like, oh, she's grown so much. And they're measuring the height. But Meriwether is short and on a stool. How do you know that her height from the floor of the stool to Meriwether's shoulders is her height? It's not. It's not. 
Right, but they it's think so it is. They're like, my, how she's grown. I know. And then the fabric. <laughs> oh, God. Give me a heart attack. So they bad. take the fabric. She cuts a big-ass hole in it. <laughs> And they're like, what's the hole for? She goes, that's the bottom of the dress, dear. See, you just step in. And then you're, like, going to just cinch the yep. fabric up by your waist with a bunch of bows. <laughs> oh, my gosh. My eyes twitching just thinking about so it. Bad. It's so bad. So the dress is hideous. <laughs> Mary, Weather, and Fauna start to get teary-eyed because they realize Aurora <laughs> has grown up. Flora says they need to focus and get going on everything so it can be finished in time. <laughs> and then we see Aurora. So we're out of the cottage now. We're with Aurora. She's walking through the forest, barefoot. Philia, I'm with that. Singing to the animals. She befriends them all. And she sings Blue, Be- Blue Bird, I Wonder is the name of the song. There are bluebirds and owls, squirrels, and deer, and they're just following her as she's singing. And then we segue over to Philip, who is now a handsome young man, Mm -hmm. and he hears the beautiful song and wants to follow Aurora's voice. His horse, Samson, isn't as thrilled to go find out who the owner of the voice is. He has to be promised an extra bucket of oats and a few carrots before he agrees to go. I he's love got such attitude. This starts the beginning trend of all sassiness and all Disney horses. Uh-huh. Well, there's the goof, uh, Goofy's How to Ride a Horse. That uh-huh. horse had some sass oh, in it, too. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so, I mean, all horses, I believe, Perfect. from this point Perfect. forward, Very sassy. are so sassy. Like, the horse in Tangled. Uh-huh. Um... Oh, goodness. Uh, the horse in uh, Hunchback. Yes. Oh, yeah. I forgot. There's Philippe's got a little personality. Not as much sass, but he's got some personality behind him. Yep. But, yeah, I mean, the amount of personality that Disney films had start, started to incorporate into the horses is phenomenal. It is. I love Samson. It's really great. So, they take <laughs> off to follow the voice. Somehow, they get to a stream. Samson stops. Prince Philip keeps going. <laughs> Falls into the stream, is soaked. He pulls his the cape oh over his God. head. He goes, no more carrots. You will not be getting carrots. <laughs> oh, and Samson's Samson. like, oh, man. <laughs> I thought he was doing so good. He feels like, I'm doing it. And I was like, nope. <laughs> then we're back with Aurora, continuing to sing with the animals. And she asks why the fairies keep treating her like a child. And she doesn't want... And they don't want her to meet anyone. Why don't they want her to meet Mm -hmm. anyone? She's talking to the animals. She's so confused. So she tells the animals that, unbeknownst to her, you know, fairy godmothers there, that she has met someone. Which I believe they're, they call, she calls them her aunts. Aunts, probably. Yeah. She's met someone, a prince. (laughs) She talks to him and they do things together like walking and talking in the forest but then confesses it's only a dream (laughs) love it love it the animals want to cheer her up because she is down now she's sad that she can't be treated like an adult and be see other people Mm. and they see prince philip's things that are drying on a tree branch so he came out of the stream pulled all of his boots and his cape and things like that and outerwear outerwear set him on the tree branch to dry (laughs) while he's waiting next to it so the animals see it they go to take his things as they're taking the things samson and prince philip catches them in the act of stealing it (laughs) They're taking his things because what they're going to do is dress up the <laughs> owl to be a prince so Aurora can t- talk to her prince of her dreams. And the owl is very excited for that role. You could see it. He's like, I'm going to be Aurora's prince. Oh my goodness, yeah. Like, he's, he's so excited. He's so proud of that role. So proud. So they go see Aurora. Aurora is very happy to see her dream prince. <laughs> Which is an owl. Which is the owl. And she plays along and starts to sing Once Upon a Dream. One of my favorite songs. Mm-hmm. Prince Philip and his horse catch up with the animals and they see Princess Aurora. He is instantly struck by her beauty and grace. He switches places with the owl and joins in on her song. She is initially startled as she is not allowed to talk to strangers. He tries to convince her they have met before mm-hmm. in her dreams. He continues to sing their song, and they dance and end up falling in love. After five minutes. (laughs) Well, 
And similar thing with Snow White. She was yes. singing, Prince came, he was singing, except she was yep. like, I gotta go! And she ran into the house. Yeah. <clears throat> this, not so similar. much. She's like, okay. Um, he asks what her name is. She hesitates and runs off. Then she says they can meet each other someday. And he goes, tomorrow? And she goes, no! Today! <laughs> Which cracks oh me up. She invites him to meet her godmothers or aunts or whatever at the cottage that evening. Yeah, the woodcutter's cottage. Oh, so funny. I'll, we'll meet again one day. Tomorrow? No, today. And I must say, I like the song Once Upon a Dream, but I like the Lana Del Rey version from oh. Maleficent so much better. Oh, I do like... It's a darker version. I do like that I version, too. Love, but I love I love that song. Yeah, no matter I, what the version, I no, love I love song. the song. It's, it's so one beautiful. of my favorites, but I must say, I love Lana Del Rey's version. Yeah. Okay, so we're back at the cottage. <laughs> and we see Fauna's oh well-known cake falling over, <laughs> being you, supported by a If you room. don't know the cake, shame on you. The best cake ever in any Disney movie, so I don't know where the heck you found. Flora's dress is hideous. Oh. Mary Weather says it needs magic to make it better to even salvage oh, it. Which is so true. It's got bows and, all over. Oh, it's so bad. It's kind of like Cinderella's dress gone wrong. Like if the yes. the mice and the birds did a great job, Mary Weather did not. Oh my this, goodness. This is, is like so bad. And it's the Pinterest in it because of how they nailed it. it together. Yes. <laughs> It is so bad because of how they folded the hole in the middle with she the fabric She looks like a sack of potatoes. Head. It looks so bad. It's like, horrific. Oh. So bad. So they agree, <laughs> yes, we need magic. We are a lost cause. Yes. Close all the windows and the doors. Make sure. Mary yep. Weather goes to get the wands. Her <laughs> job is to clean the house, which... She puts together, like, makes the broom and everything start magically moving. Her face is, like, just so mad because she didn't want to clean the house. No, like, she wants to do something like make a freaking dress. Make something, yeah. Right. But this part reminds me of Fantasia in The Sorcerer's Apprentice, where the music yeah. is going and they have the brooms doing the cleaning for them. Yep. yep. I love it. I yeah, love the this. animation with the broom and the mop as it was walking to her is very similar mm -hmm. to what they did in Fantasia for the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yeah. Fauna uses her wand to make the cake over again. Thank, Thank God. Goodness. Flora <laughs> uses her wand to make the dress again. Thank, Thank goodness. goodness. But Meriwether hates the pink, so she turns it blue with her wand. Flora and Meriwether continue to argue over the color of Aurora's gown, their magic attracting the attention of Maleficent's raven, who learns Aurora's location by seeing the magic color shooting out of the chimney. So they're like hiding behind things and shooting yes. the dress with their wand. One will turn it pink, the other will turn and it at blue. At one point, Flora ended up in a blue dress because it accidentally mm -hmm. caught her butt and Meriwether, it reflected off of the pan that was behind yes. her and it made her pink, which, by the way, Meriwether in pink is adorable. She's just cute. She's... I love <sighs> her. And love it also... Her. What, I, it would always kind of i had a question was the crow is sitting on the chimney watching this happen getting struck by color how does he not turn blue or pink because maybe it's a fabric only <sighs> cast a spell i don't know he should have been pink and blue that would have been kind of funny though <laughs> if he was pink and blue yep <sighs> Mary Weather and Flora change each other's clothes into their hated color, like we said. Oh, so they great. even make the dress into a half pink, half blue dress because which they is my favorite. They hit it at the same time. It is my favorite. It reminds me of cotton candy. It does. It looks like cotton candy. I for love sure. it. I would wear that dress. Then they hear Aurora coming home, <laughs> and they have to put everything away, all the magic objects. Oh. They light the candles real quick. They turn the dress into solid pink again. Yep. Well, Mary Weather didn't, but you know. <laughs> Because she would have been, let's make it blue. They hide to surprise her. Returning home, Aurora is so thrilled to tell her guardians that she has fallen in love. The fairies finally tell Aurora that she is a princess. Because she comes in and she's like, I met someone. I love him. He's a prince. And she's, they're like, you can't. You're betrothed to somebody else. 
what? But I can't be betrothed to a prince. I'm not a princess. Yeah. Yes, you are a princess, Cupcake. And then they're like, she's like, what? My entire like, life was a lie. Whole day changed to figure out that whole thing. Mm. Oh, by the way, your name isn't Briar Rose. It's also Aurora. <laughs> yep. Lots of things are changing for you real it's quick, so sweetie. It's Aurora. So she is upset. She's heartbroken because she wants to be with the man that she met in the forest. She does what every princess does. She throws herself down and cries. <laughs> she cries in her room. The raven, overhearing everything, returns to the uh, returns the news to Maleficent. We then see the castle. King Stefan and King Hubert <laughs> talking about the return of Princess Aurora. One of my favorite other things uh-huh. in this movie is they sing the song Scumps <laughs> and they cheer to their children being married all along as they're drinking. The musician that has oh, like he's got the, I don't, loot. the loot is getting drunk. He's like filling the loot with the <laughs> booze favorite, and drinking it and then passes oh. out under the table. I love him. It's so funny. I love him so much. So King Hubert <laughs> <clears throat> who's Prince Philip's dad, wants to rush the marriage and move them into a castle that he's already built. Yeah. King Stefan is like, hold up, slow down. Aurora doesn't even know about anything. You can't just like... And they don't even know her. Like, he hasn't seen her since she was born. Right. So King <sighs> Hubert takes offense uh-huh. because he's like, my son's not good enough for you. My castle's not good enough for you. <laughs> so he's trying to fight King <laughs> Stefan. But soon they quickly laugh it off. Yep. And they talk about the prince and the princess quickly having children. <laughs> they then find the musician drunk and asleep under the table. <laughs> Philip comes into the castle and tells his father he wishes to marry a peasant girl he met in the woods. <laughs> King Hubert thinks he's joking. He can't believe his son would give up the throne. He tells his father, it's the 14th century, Dad, yeah. and he can marry any woman he wants. He just wants to marry one he loves, and then quickly is like, peace out, gotta go back to her house, uh-huh. meet all her fam, and the prince just goes, and he's like, wait, what? I don't, what? So king, the king is devastated, and now he's like, how am I going to tell my friend King Stefan that my son does not want to marry his daughter and is running off with some floozy in the woods? <laughs> So then we see the fairies bringing Aurora back to the castle through the woods in the middle of the night. Again, very closed, like, cloaks over their head, very, like, sneaky through the night. And they put her up in her room where she's waiting for her birthday celebration and to be reunited with her parents. The fairies, before they leave her alone, give her one last gift, her crown. Again, Princess Aurora cries, so they just leave her alone. She is upset about not being able to marry the prince of her dreams. Then the music starts to get creepy, and everything gets a green hue to it. This, like, door opens up. Mm Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the fairies are outside of the room discussing the the boy in the woods, and... They hear the Maleficent, like eerie music, and they're like, oh no, we left her alone. So Maleficent appears, and she lures her down this magic hallway that just appeared, and into a dark tower, and she tricks her into touching a spindle of a cursed spinning wheel. Mm -hmm. Again, like we said, make whatever she wants. So you burnt all those things for nothing. Yeah. How you been making clothes? That's how I want to know. (laughs) Imports. Oh. Imports have gone way up the last 16 years. They're they about just to go cut, way this down. This is why fa- they don't know how to make a dress. They haven't made a dress in 16 years. <laughs> sure. Let's cut a hole in it. So the fairies are right on her tail. They're chasing after her, but they're too late. Mm-hmm. Aurora pricks her finger, fulfilling the curse only moments before the sun sets. So close. Yep. Maleficent laughs her evil laugh again and disappears, and the fairies take the blame. They are like, we are responsible. We were supposed to be watching her. We screwed yeah. up big time. King Which, Hubert. Sorry, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you did. You could have congregated in the corner of the it, room, not the outside. T- curse the is until her 16th birthday when the sun sets. Yeah. You cannot wait until after that. Uh-huh. What is wrong with uh-huh. you? <laughs> uh-huh. You you couldn't leave the cottage 
for another 15 minutes like right you to go, you right or to be safe slower. just do it one more day what's one more day right. to stay at home i right. don't understand so we're now back with king hubert who is going to have to tell us friend stefan about prince philip falling in love with someone else and in that moment, the sun sets. The kingdom cheers because they think they are going to see mm-hmm. their princess. Fireworks are shooting off. And then three fairies decide they need to put Sleeping Aurora in her bed in the highest tower. They are devastated and know that king, the king and the queen are going to be heartbroken. They decide the best way to do this is to cast a spell on everyone in the kingdom, causing them to sleep alongside Aurora. Everyone's going to sleep until her curse is broken. So the Sleeping Beauty song plays as the fairies fly around the castle, putting everyone to sleep. Another scene that I really enjoy watching. Mm -hmm. Flora overhears the sleepy conversation. (laughs) She's going to put the kings to sleep. And as she just puts them to sleep, he's trailing off in his sentence. <laughs> he, King Hubert is going, telling about that, you know, my son, Prince Philip, loves this girl in the woods that he met. <laughs> and Flora's like, what? What girl in the forest? Wake up, wake up, like, tell me. And yeah. he's like, out. And she's like, oh my gosh, Aurora and Philip. Well, were- he's like, oh, something once upon a dream. Yes. And she's like, <laughs> light bulb they're the same people shoot we should have just let this go yeah (laughs) so flora runs back and tells the others they rush to go find him they go to the cottage because that's where he was supposed to be meeting them but again too late we see prince of philip prince philip going to the cottage to see the woman of his dreams but instead finds maleficent her goblins jump him and tie him up and she takes him back to her castle the fairies are right behind them after they leave and they find his hat on the floor and that he's been abducted by Maleficent. So they go to the Forbidden Mountain where Maleficent's castle hideout thing is and they sneak into the castle avoiding all the goblin henchmen. They are having a celebration, the goblins are, about capturing the prince and putting the princess to death. So there's like a big fire in the middle of the castle. Yep. Another bonfire. Huge party for them. And they're like, just dance around. Maleficent is just seems like not overly pleased. Like, you would think she would be happy. She's just like... Eh. I think it's just... It's it's something that is just accomplished. Like, it's... That, and I think she knows she technically didn't die. Possibly. Yeah. So yeah. it's not f- fully fulfilled right. yet. So... She talks to her raven, and she decides to go cheer up the prince. (laughs) Goodness. The fairies follow her. Once at the prison cell, which holds Prince Philip, she shows him the sleeping princess Aurora. She lets him know it is the same maiden he met in the forest. Mm -hmm. She tells him about how she will look, lock him away, until he is an old man on the verge of death. Yep. Only then she will release him to meet his love, who will not have aged a single day. It will then be too late for him to save her with love's true kiss. Yep. And it shows him, like, old... Oh, my goodness. Like, old man walking out of the cat, like, her castle on her on his way to yep. Princess Aurora. The fairy... So, Maleficent leaves. The fairies rescue Philip. And they arm him with the magical sword of truth and the shield of virtue because they will triumph over evil. Maleficent sees the prince trying to escape and warns the others. The goblins attack with rocks, which the fairies turn into bubbles. (laughs) I love this part. I do too. Then they shoot arrows, which the fairies turn into flowers. They try to pour boiling water onto them, but the fairies (laughs) turn it into a rainbow. And Merriweather then goes after the raven and turns him into a statue. Love it. Maleficent comes out and, and hearing the commotion, she's like, What's happening? And she's enraged. Yep. So she curses King Stephen's castle by surrounding it with a wall of thorns. That way Prince Philip can't get to it. Yep. But that doesn't stop Prince Philip, who is slicing through the thorns with his new uh, sword. She 
Yeah, then, Flora sharpened the sword mm-hmm. to cut through it. Yep. So then she, Maleficent is like, what you can't do, you know, you'd better do to yourself. Yep. It's, not, it's not working. So she goes there <laughs> to confront him directly, transforming into an enormous black dragon. Uh-huh. And battle with the forces of evil, plays. Proper title. Perfect title, right? They battle, and Philip throws the sword blessed by the fairies, directly into Maleficent's heart, killing her. The dragon, Maleficent, falls to her death. And we can see on the ground, like, her cloak and the sword, and that's it. Like, she evaporates. Like, she's dead. Yeah, but what's left on the ground is, like, a perfect silhouette of her form. Mm Mm-hmm. So, it kind of reminds me of, like, um, when you pour water on a witch, like, the melting thing. Yeah. melting. It's like that. It's just like she's gone. Uh Uh-huh. Philip goes to Aurora's room and awakens her with a kiss, breaking the spell and waking the kingdom. Awakening, love theme, plays. The the kings wake up thinking it was all the wine that they (laughs) drank. He goes, oh, must have been the wine. (laughs) King Hubert goes to tell King Stefan something. He's trying to remember. It's kind of hazy. Then he's like, oh, yeah, my son doesn't want to marry. But just as he's about to say something, the royal couple (laughs) descend down the staircase to the ballroom where Aurora is reunited with her parents. The fairies are overjoyed. Aurora kisses King Rupert's head, Hubert's Mm -hmm. head, which reminds me of Cinderella and how she kissed yeah. the prince's head. And they look so much alike. They, yes. Those two kings are very similar. As the prince and princess dance, Fauna begins to cry over the happy ending. Fauna's always crying. Mm-hmm. It is then that Flora notices <laughs> the dress is blue. Yeah, the entire time she's been looking at her, put her into bed, and this entire time... She's seen that it's blue, but she didn't really notice it was blue. It's blue. And now she's mad. And now Flora and Merriweather resume their dis- <sighs> dispute over Aurora's gown. While the happy couple dances into the cloud and the book's clo- is closing, they live happily ever after, we just see the dr- dress continuously pink, blue, pink, yeah. blue. Pink, and into blue. the clouds it's changing. Oh, yes. goodness. And that's the end. <sighs> so... Watching this, I noticed that the the woodcutter's cottage, Belle's cottage, yes. closely resembles yes. the cottage. I think the roofs are a little bit different, obviously, but for the most part, like it's got the wheel right next to it. Like it's very, it very closely resembles Belle's cottage. Some artists who worked on this film came back to Disney in 1988 and 1989 to work on Oliver and Company, The Little Mermaid, and The Rescuers Down Under. These artists included Don Selders, Eve Fletcher, Anne Oliphant, Darlene Kanegi, Gordon Bellamy, Tom Ferder, Eleanor Dolan, Sheila Brown, and Valentine Vreeland Paul. I'm assuming that's how you say that. Mm -hmm. Um, Aurora is one of the seven princesses of heart in the popular Disney Squaresoft game Kingdom Hearts. Maleficent is a villain in all three Kingdom Hearts games. She's my favorite villain. I love her. I think she's my favorite. She's my favorite villain. By far. Hands down. Love her so much. Yeah, I think she's she's it would. I like the evil queen, but I think I just like the evil queen because I like like her clothes. Oh, but I love Maleficent. I no, absolutely I love, love Maleficent. Maleficent so much. Um, and the three good fairies also appear in Kingdom Hearts too. The character of Aurora's mother, which is the queen. She has no name credited to her. The only version of the story which gives her a name is, in fact, in the 1993 adaptation by A.L. Singer, in which she is named Queen Leah. Queen Leah. But yeah. she doesn't have a name in any other version. The cry that is voiced by Lucille Laverne as the evil queen in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves is reused as Male- or for Maleficent when the dragon form is pierced by Prince Philip's sword. Rich Animation Studios animated um, the th- sorry the Rich animation Animation Studios animated the film of the Swan Princess, 
which is very similar to this film in that it has a princess named Odette being cursed by a sorcerer named Sir Rothbart, just as Maleficent cursed Aurora. In the end, Odette died temporarily as Aurora fell into a deep sleep, and a prince named Derek saved her by killing Rothbart, oh, who had turned himself into the great animal, just as Maleficent transformed herself into a dragon, and Prince Philip killed her to save Aurora with true love's kiss. Interestingly, the story is also based on Tchaikovsky's ballet, Swan Lake. The filmmakers chose not to adapt the ballet score, going instead with a generic 90s pop score by Lex de Azevedo. Zev- avocado. I was going to say avocado. <laughs> um, the cookies that mainly Mary Weather eats. She likes yeah. to eat her feelings. She's a little plump girl. The cookies that she is eating her heart out when they're trying to figure out like what to do after Melis- Maleficent curses Aurora are hidden Mickeys. Yeah. They're Mickey-shaped cookies. They're so cute. The film was made while Walt Disney was building Disneyland. Hence, the four-year production time on this film. This was helped to promote the film um, Imagineers declared the castle to be at Walt Disney Land to be Sleeping Beauty Castle, Sleeping Beauty's castle, while it was originally supposed to be Snow White's. Which, another fun fact, it's facing backwards. That's crazy. So the front is the back, and the back is the front. <laughs> um, second to only Dumbo, who didn't speak at all. This Disney title character, Aurora has the fewest lines of actual dialogue through the entire film. That's true. She, there's like, she's just singing. She says nothing in the entire second half. Yeah. She says almost nothing in the first. Yeah, she just sings for a portion. She says a couple things and that's it. She yep. really doesn't talk. Nope. She's got, she says nothing. <clears throat> the musical score throughout the film was provided by the Gronk Symphony Orchestra. Since 1990, it was called the Munich Symphony Orchestra, which is under the direction of the score's adapter, George Bruns. The particular melody that plays as Prince Philip and Aurora descend the stairs toward the film's end was a uh, Brannel Koopa, which is a short, vigorous country dance entitled Cassandra, written by Renaissance composer Thano Arbo. If I butchered it, I don't care. <laughs> I We're give you sorry. <laughs> which was adapted uh, around 1590, and it is. It was adapted as a march in honor of King Henry the Sixth of France. Sorry, King Henry the Fourth of France, and used as something of a national anthem by French royalists. Tchaikovsky, who had a very big fondness for national anthems, apparently incorporated it into his ballet to represent the royal court of Fleurston the Ninth. The complex and detailed background paintings, most of which were done by Frank Armitage and Elvin Earl usually took seven to ten times longer to paint than average, which takes about a work day to complete. As opposed to having the backgrounds be designed to match the characters, the film's characters were designed to match the backgrounds. This film is the only Disney film, wait for it, it's the only one with square trees. Oh my gosh, and she told me this yesterday, and we looked it up, and I'm like, oh my gosh, how have I never noticed they are square? Yeah. I, I Looking through the background, I've seen one tree that looks normal, and it's a very small tree. It's in the very back. It's one of the only trees that is actually in that scene, but when you see groups of trees, the trunks are very detailed. The trunks of the trees are so very well, very realistically detailed, but the tops... Our, it's it's like looking at a bush on a on a yeah trunk. it looks like shrubbery it looks like somebody <laughs> has cut them it's so hilarious yeah it looks like a topiary the debate on the setting of this film has been a problem for a long time nobody knows exactly where it was supposed to be taking place the moment where Aurora pricks her finger 
as well as the fight of Prince Philip with Maleficent are referenced in the Nightwish song Phantasmic with the lyrics Maleficent's Fury, the spindle so luring, and Dragon's Fight. Upon release, the scene where Prince Philip encounters the dragon was thought to be too intense for children. I can kind of see it, but yeah. then I'm like, eh, you gotta learn eventually. <laughs> The original concept for the film began in 1950 after the studio had animated two other princess fairy tales. Work on this was delayed because Walt Disney's attention was turned to the building of Walt Disneyland, which is in California. If you didn't know that Disneyland's in California and Disney World is in Florida. Some people don't know the difference. Walt Disney had originally envisioned the film as his masterpiece, which is every single movie. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Everyone. (laughs) Oh, boy. Love it. (laughs) Because... This is my favorite. Now this is my favorite. Now this is my favorite. Pick one, Walt. I think it's... I think it's... Every time he does it, he's like, Oh, I get bigger and better every single time. Uh Like, this is my new masterpiece. Like, oh, nope, this one's better. This is my masterpiece. Which, I mean, I get it. But at the same time, it's like, Listen, you are an up-and-coming... Like, this this is new to you. You're going to get better because you're getting experience. Right, you're, and you're learning new processes like, that were coming out at that time that right, movie and itself creating was us. It's changing. Yeah. Right. Um, because the film was such a box office disappointment, which is not anything new, Disney focused more on live action films for two entire years. There were ten uh, live action films before Walt Disney had released another animated feature, which wow. is 101 Dalmatians. And the style of animation in this one was radically different. Yes, possibly. You could see that for yeah. Sure. And possibly because it had been such a failure. The film was in the archive for seven years. This, appear- this film appears as one. Of the transition levels in Epic Mickey found in Dark Beauty Castle. I've never played Epic Mickey. I always wanted it. I've never played Epic Mickey either. Um, this film is the first Disney animated classic to have the 2006 Walt Disney Pictures logo at the end of current releases. Which there is one that at the end actually has like the 1990s, late 80s version of the castle. One of them still has that version. Okay. I can't remember. Um... This film is the first... Nope. We're going to scratch that. I said that. Um, The studios have no record as to who provided the voices for the Queen nor the Royal Herald. Hmm. Which I'm like... That seems weird to me. Um, Well, the Queen only has like one line. Like she says to Maleficent, Yeah. I hope you're not... Of offended your met like your excellency or something. Yeah, and I think she says like no when she curses or yeah. So that's it. Yeah, but I'm just shocked. But, like they didn't. But Harold use... has tons, <laughs> right? Because isn't it King Harold? Or no, that's Hubert. No, J.K. The Royal Harold, I think, is the guy with. Is he the one with the loot? Mm, maybe. No. 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 Nope. Just a lie. The Royal Her- Herald is the guy that's announcing everything. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the Herald. Got it. Just kidding. So he probably just threw somebody in just to get those two little parts done. Possibly. Um, Barbara Jo Allen, which is Fauna, is also known in some of her other films as Verna Va- Vogue. And her last film role as the scholarly maid in The Sword and, and the Stone. So she played so many And the sword and the stone in this movie are have such a similar aesthetic, it's insane. Yeah. The coloring is very similar to the the coloring, the just design of it, the time period ish like very, very similar. Yep. A flamethrower This is so freaking funny. A flamethrower was used to create the dragon breath sound for the climax of the film with training films supplied by the U.S. Army. So the U.S. Army had given Walt Disney Studios films to show them how to use a flamethrower just for sound. (laughs) 
so ridiculous. Which I wonder, because they took so many of their visuals from things, I wonder if they actually got the flames yes, from, from there it, as well. Possibly. But still, a flamethrower. so funny. What did you use to make your movie a flamethrower? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, as we had mentioned, um, Barbara Ludi, Ludi, Meriwether, um, also lent her voice to Lady from Lady and the Tramp. After this, she would also end up voicing Mother Rabbit and Robin Hood and Kanga in The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Eleanor Audley, which we know her as Maleficent, was also Lady Tremaine in Cinderella nine years prior. She plays a really good villain. I was just going to say that. She (laughs) is a really good villain. Um, Before... Taylor Holmes was chosen for the voice of King Stefan in the final version. Hans Conrad, 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 Conrad provided some of the voicing as heard in the demo after doing the voices and models for both Captain Hook and Mr. Darling and Peter Pan. Verna Felton, Flora. Previously lent her voice to the Elephant Matriarch and Mrs. Jumbo in Dumbo, the Fairy Godmother in Cinderella, the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland, and Aunt Sarah in Lady and the Tramp. Which, again, I mean, Mrs. Jumbo wasn't a villain. Um, Flora, technically, she's not a villain. But they, it's that, like, bossy attitude. Yeah. She's got that down. And yeah. all those characters, that bossy, I know better than you... Yeah. attitude. <laughs> yeah. She's a very good, like, like, matriarch yes. character. Yes. And a very, she's she's very, like, type A mm-hmm. voice personality. <clears throat> um, after this film, Verna Felton would lend her voice one more time for Winifred in The Jungle Book. Which shocks me, because when did The Jungle Book come out? Oh, I I feel like that was way later. I might be wrong. There's been a couple movies that I'm like, oh, I thought that happened like way later than what it did. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, that was... I think that's been... That's a long (laughs) time between that they used. Yeah. Um, The animators couldn't... So, here we go. So after the square trees, this is my next favorite. (laughs) The animators could not decide what color Aurora's dress should be. So they decided to make it part of the storyline. So the dress is going from pink to blue, from pink to blue, is not just cutesy fairies. They were animators fighting over pink and blue and pink and blue. So I wonder if each thing it was like I wonder if one animator as he was animating it just didn't know that the dress was blue. So I wonder if that's when she's like, oh, the dress is blue. It's been blue. So I wonder if like maybe he didn't realize that it's been blue the whole time and is like, nope, nope, gotta continue it. Gotta be pink. So funny. Way to take something like a disagreement and put it to something better. Oh, so funny. And the or- opening previews, so we both knew this because we had this release. In the opening previews of the 1997 VHS re-released under Walt Disney Masterpiece Collection line, there's a commercial for Disney's Magic Artist on CD-ROM. It's so good. It's such a 90s convers- oh a, a commercial. I wanted it so bad. It Which, looks so much fun. I would do it right now if I, I had mistaken, it. Am I mistaken or is that like right after there's like a six year seven year old boy that is packing to go to Disney World and is so excited to be going to Disney World. He's packing a suit he's helping like his I don't little remember. Sister. Oh my gosh. I just remember this going oh, I really, really I watched this. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't have a computer when I was that age. I did, but I didn't have a printer. I did not. No, I had a printer. It was uh what is it, like the dot what is it like the really old ones that oh. make noise? Oh, okay. Yep, one of those. <sighs> yeah. Still on dot there. matrix. Dot, I had a dot matrix printer. That's hilarious. Um, Sleeping Beauty is referenced in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code as an allegory of the Grail Quest. Did not know that. Mm-mm. The music to the song Once Upon a Dream is based on a waltz from Tchaikovsky's ballet Sleeping Beauty 
as is almost all the rest of the music in this film. It is also used in recent commercials for Sargento Cheese. That is hysterical. Yep. As well as a couple of Fred Quimby era Tom and Jerry cartoons. The Sleeping Spell was spoofed on Hannah Barbara's The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo in 1985, in which Scooby-Doo must save Daphne Blake and Princess Esmeralda from the spell caused by Muldor, the malevolent... Don't know. Interestingly, in the episode of What's New Scooby-Doo, Daphne wore an outfit very similar to Aurora's. Did it turn pink and blue? I would hope. Or maybe it's the one where it looks like cotton candy. Maybe. Um, Of course, we've been talking about it for a couple episodes. The recycled scene where we have Cinderella and the Prince at the Ball. We have Aurora and Philip now at the very end dancing. Mm -hmm. And this one you can see. And Belle and Prince Adam at the end of Beauty and the Beast is all very very similar you can tell all they did was change what everything pretty much looked like but you can tell like as far as outline animation everything it looks the same they just changed the details to match the artistry of each film also i don't understand how it was the owl floating I know. He was not flapping his wings because he couldn't flap his wings. And the birds were only holding up the arms of, like... His jacket. His jacket. Yeah, cloak thing. How the heck was an owl just floating in midair? He was that in love. He was just (sighs) levitating, Jeannie. No? Also, (laughs) Maleficent somehow knew that Prince Philip was going back to the woodcutter's cottage. How did she know? Because the crow left and flew away before... Aurora had said he's coming here tonight. Yeah. So how did she know? Don't know. She's (laughs) she's a magical being, that's for sure. (sighs) Plot hole. Following the critical and commercial success of Cinderella, writing for Sleeping Beauty began in early 1951. Partial story elements originated from discarded ideas for Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, including Maleficent's capture of Prince Philip and his dramatic escape from her fortress. In Cinderella, where and Cinderella, where a fantasy sequence featured the leading protagonist dancing on a cloud, which was developed, but eventually dropped from the film. So they took those two hmm. things that they didn't use and put them in this one. Which is cool. Which is smart. Yep. Nothing Nothing goes to waste. Yep. By the middle of 1953, director Wilfred Jackson had recorded the dialogue, assembled a story reel, and was to commence for the prim- preliminary uh, animation work where Princess Aurora and Prince Philip were to meet in the forest and dance. Though Walt Disney decided to throw out the sequence, delaying the film from its initial 1955 release date. For a number of months, Jackson, Ted Jackson, Ted Sears, and two story writers underwent a rewrite of the story, which received a lukewarm response from Disney. During the story rewriting process, the story writers fell felt the original fairy tale second act felt bizarre and with the wake up kiss serving a climatic movement <clears throat> they decided to concentrate on the first half of finding st- strength in the romance. However, they felt little romance was developed between the strange prince and the princess, stranger prince and the princess, that the storyboard artist worked out an elaborate sequence in which the king organized a treasure hunt. <laughs> the idea was eventually dropped because it was too drawn out and drifted from the central storyline. Thank God. Mm-hmm. Instead, it was written that Prince Philip and Princess Aurora would meet in the forest by random chance while Princess Aurora, renamed Briar Rose, was conversing with the forest animals. Additionally, because the original Peralt tale had the curse last 100 years, the writers decided to shorten it to a few hours with the time spent for Prince Philip to battle the goons, overcome several obstacles, and fight off against Maleficent transformed into when she transformed into the dragon so 16 years instead of 100 years mm-hmm. which would be good because you know 
whatever. You're going, <laughs> you're going to be too old. Um, Sleeping Beauty versions. So these are stories of Sleeping Beauty that Disney took some inspiration from. Mm -hmm. The earliest known version of the story is found in the narrative Perseforest, composed between 1333 and 1344. The tale was first published by oh, these names, G.M. Basile. I, I can't say the last name. I don't know how to say that first uh, name. G.M. Batista. Something. Basile. In his collection of tales titled The Penamiron, this version of Sleeping Beauty was known as The Sun, Moon, and Talia. The Sleeping Beauty is raped in this version by a passing king, and then she gives birth to two children while she's still sleeping. Early contributors to the tale include the medieval courtly romance, Pure Forest, um, published in 1528. In this tale, a princess named Zeladine falls in love with a man named Troilus. Her father sends him to perform tasks to prove himself worthy of her, and while he is gone, Zeladine falls into an enchanted sleep. Troilus finds her and impregnates her in her sleep. When, when their child is born, the child draws from her finger the flax that caused her to sleep. She realizes from the ring Troilus has left her that he is the father, and Troilus later returns to marry her. The second part of Sleeping Beauty tale, in which the princess and her children are almost put to death, but instead are hidden, may have been influenced by Genevieve of Brabant. Brothers Grimm version included a variant of Sleeping Beauty. Theirs is called Little Briar Rose in their collection of 18, in 1812. Their version ends when the prince arrives to wake Sleeping Beauty, his name is Rosamond, and does not include the part two as found in Basil's and Perrault's versions. Um, in hiding, she is called Briar Rose, which is the name of... Or in the Brothers Grimm, Grimm's version. So that's variant. where they got it from. And I wasn't even going to put it in here. I couldn't even begin to pronounce the very German way to say it because it is like 25 letters oh long. Lord. There's a G. There's some little dots above some letters. And I'm just like... Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. So, Sleeping Beauty took place in the 14th century. We don't know exactly where, like we said. Which is easy, because they say it right in the thing. I know. So this is a 14th easy. century dad. I can marry whoever I want. It is so great, though. Like, what other film is like, listen, this is the time period. I know. It's awesome. Aurora is between 14 and 16 years of age. Well, she's 16 on her birthday, but, like... Yeah. Whatever. That's in this version. <clears throat> yeah. Country is unknown, like I said. The name given to the princess by her royal birth parents, Aurora, is Latin for dawn, so that's accurate. Because they said, you know, we're naming her after the dawn because she brings sunlight into her hearts mm -hmm. or whatever. Correct. Um, as it was their, in the original of Tchaikovsky's ballet. This name occurred in Charles Perrault's version as well. Not as the princess's name, though, but as her daughter's. <laughs> also, Aurora is a Roman um, goddess, and she's the goddess of sunrise, mm -hmm. and as we've stated, she's a classic princess. She's one of the last classic ones that Disney had before he passed away. Yep, she is the last. She is the last, so yep. things change after when they make Ariel. It's mm -hmm. a whole different version of princesses. Oh, absolutely. The prince was given the princely name most familiar to Americans in the 1950s. <laughs> prince Philip, named after Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. And the character has the distinction of being the first Disney prince to have a name, as the two prince, princes in Snow White and in Cinderella were never named, which we spoke about before. Yeah. In December 1953, Jackson suffered a heart attack, as a result of which directing animator Eric Larson of Disney Nine Old Men took over as director. By April 1954, Sleeping Beauty was scheduled for a February 1957 release. With Larson as the director, Disney instructed Larson, whose unit would animate the first sequence, that the picture was to be a moving illustration, the ultimate in animation, and added that he did not care how long it was going to take. Because of his delays, the release day was again pushed back from Christmas 
1957 to Christmas 1958. Fellow nine, o- fellow nine old men, Milt Call, would blame Walt for the numerous release dates because he wouldn't have story meetings. He wouldn't get the damn thing moving. <laughs> Can you imagine how frustrating it must be for those people that are like, come on, let's just do this and yeah, get it done. And he's having, um, we discussed that he was having a race between Alice and Cinderella. Mm-hmm. So he's paying more attention to, okay, which of these two films can we push win. forward? Yeah, so he's yeah. paying attention to more crap like that than... Yeah. Relatively late in production, Disney removed Larson as the supervising director and replaced him with Clyde Geronimi. Directing animator Wolfgang Reitherman would join Geronimi as sequence director over the climatic dragon battle sequence, commenting that, We took the approach that we were going to kill that damned prince. Les Clark, another member of the Nine Old Men, would serve as the sequence director of the elaborate opening scene where crowds of citizens in the kingdom arrive at the palace for the presentation of Princess Aurora. The animation style moved away from the Rocco of Cinderella and also does not simply draw on fashion and female beauty standards of the time and draws upon distinctive visual combination of medieval art imagery and art deco design. K. Nielsen, whose sketches were the basis for Night on Bald Mountain in Fantasia, was the first to produce styling sketches for the film in 1952. The artistic style originated with when John Hench observed the famous the famed unicorn tapestries at the cloisters located at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. When Hench, Hench returned to Disney Studios, he brought reproductions of the tapestries and showed them to Walt Disney, Disney who replied, Yeah, we could use that for the style of Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> Just like, no big deal, sure, mm-hmm. whatever. For Sleeping Beauty, Ivan Earl said he felt totally free to put my own style into the paintings he based on hench's drawings stating where his trees might have curved i straightened them out yep square trees square trees square i took a hench and then i took the same subject and the composition he had and just turned it into my own (sighs) style yes you did sir you certainly did oh my goodness square trees when Geronimi became supervising director, Earl and Geronimi entered furious creative differences. Geronimi commented that he felt Earl's paintings lacked the mood in a lot of things, and that the beautiful detail in the trees, the bark, and all that, that's all well and good, but who the hell is going to look at that? Mm-hmm. The backgrounds became more important than the animation. He made them more like Christmas cards. So he was so mad. Earl left the Disney Studios in March 1958 before Sleeping Beauty was completed to take a job at John S- Sutherland Productions. As a result, Geronimi had Earl's background painting softened and diluted from their distinct medieval texture. Before the animation process began... A live-action reference version was filmed with live actors in costume serving as models for the animators in which Walt Disney insisted on because he wanted the characters to appear as real as possible near flesh and blood. Yeah. And Milk Call objected to this method, calling it a crutch and stiffing of the creative effort. Anyone worth his salt in it, in this business ought to know how people move but i mean disney did this with all of them yes but it's an old concept of it is. designing it is but i mean and disney had such high standards and so i can kind of understand where he's coming from yeah. like if you are working for disney and he has these high standards you better know what the hell you're doing you shouldn't have to have a crutch of having a, a person or an animal there to for you to watch that is true Helen Stanley was the live-action reference for Princess Aurora. The only known surviving footage of Stanley as Aurora's live-action reference is a clip from the television program Disneyland, which consists of the artist sketching her dancing with the woodland animals. Stanley previously provided live-action references for Cinderella and later for Anita from 101 Dalmatians Mm -hmm. and portrayed Polly Crockett for the TV series Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. The role of Prince Philip was modeled by Ed Kemmer, who had played Commander Buzz Corey on television Space Patrol five years before Sleeping Beauty was released. For the final battle sequence, Kemmer 
was photographed on a wooden buck. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> the live action model for Maleficent was Eleanor Audley, who also voiced the villain. Dancer Jane Fowler also was a live action reference for Maleficent. Among the actresses who performed in reference footage for this film were Spring Byington and Frances Baver. Because of the artistic depths of Earl's background, it was decided for the characters to be stylized so they could appropriately match the backgrounds. <laughs> of course. Well, they would have faded out. The backgrounds were showing them up. While the layout artists and animators were impressed with Earl's painting, they eventually grew depressed at working with a style that many of them regarded as too cold, too flat, and too modernist for a fairy tale. Nevertheless, Walton insisted on the visual design, claiming that the inspirational art he commen- commissioned in the past had homo- homogenized the animators. Frank Thomas would complain to Ken Peterson, head of the animation department of Earl's very rigid design because of the inhibiting effects on the animators that was less problematic than working with Mary Blair's designs in which Peterson would respond that the design style was Walt's decision and that, like it or not, they had to use it. Because of this, Thomas developed a red blotch on his face and had to visit the doctor each week to have it attended to causing lots of stress over this movie (laughs) production designer ken anderson also complained i had to fight myself to make myself draw in that way Good grief. Really didn't like it. Another character animator of Aurora claimed their their unit was so cautious about the drawings that the cleanup animators produced one drawing a day which translates into one second of screen time per month. Jeez. That's ridiculous. It's going to take forever. Meanwhile, Tom Orb was tasked as a character stylist that would not only inhabit the style of the backgrounds, but also fit with the contemporary UPA style. Likewise, the Earl's background styling, the animators complained that the character designs were too rigid too animated. Orb had originally designed Aurora to resemble actress Audrey Hepburn, but according to animator Ron Diaz, he redesigned her. She became very angular, moving with more fluidity and elegance, but her design had a harder line. The edges of her dress became square, pointed even, and the back of her head came almost to a point rather than the round and cuddly like likeness of the other Disney princesses. It had to be done to complement the background. Mm. So, because the background with the square trees happened, yeah, Aurora... Because of the darn trees. ...is not so round and cuddly. <sighs> I love how she looks. I think she's beautiful, but that's just me. For Maleficent, animator Mark Davis drew from Czech- Czechoslovakian... La, la, la religious paintings and used the red and black drapery in the back that looked like flames that he thought would be great to use. He took the idea of the collar partly from a bat and the horns looked like a devil. However, in the act of artistic compromise, Earl, with the final approval on the character's design, requested the change to lavender as red would come off too strong, in which Davis agreed to. Yeah. And with Maleficent's horned headdress and the bat wing like sleeves, besides being reminiscent of the popular images of horned devils and dragons, mm-hmm. her costume actually reflects actual costumes of the 14th century. Which is so cool. So hers is actually, what she's wearing is accurate accurate to the time period that's pretty cool Mm -hmm. veteran animators frank thomas and ollie johnston were assigned as directing animators over the three good fairies flora fauna and meriwether while disney urged for the fairies to be more homogeneous which thomas and johnson objected to with thomas with thomas stating they thought that's not going to be any fun so we started figuring the other way and worked on how we could develop them into special personalities, which they each have their oh, own. Oh, absolutely. And it really adds to the movie. If they were just generic, all same, yeah. like, that would not have been as great. No, they... Plus, like, how are you going to work in your uh, <laughs> blue-pink thing? Oh, yeah. 
if they all feel the same way, act the same way. Uh huh. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. They did a good job. They did a very good job. John Loonsberry animated the scump sequence between King <laughs> Hubert and Stefan. Chuck Jones, known for his work as an animation director with Warner Brother cartoons, was employed on the film for four months during its early conceptual stages when Warner Brother cartoons was closed, when it was anticipated that 3D film would replace animation as a box office draw. Following the failure of 3D and the reversal of Warner's decision, Jones then returned to the other studio. His work on Sleeping Beauty, which he spent four months on, remained uncredited. (laughs) Ironically, during his early years at Warner Brothers, though, he was such a heavy user of the Disney style from working on Sleeping Beauty that Tex Avery had to get Warner out of the Disney style. Oh, goodness. So just in four months, he changed his whole artistic ability. Well... Another notable animator who worked on the film for part of the production was Don Bluth, who worked as an assistant animator to Loonsbury. Bluth would leave after two years, but eventually came back in the 1970s. In 1952, Mary Costa was invited to a dinner party where she sang When I Fall in Love at the, at the then... Oh, at the then named Los Angeles Conservatory of Music. So it used to be called that. Mm-hmm. Following the performance, she was approached by Walter Schumann, who told her, I don't want to shock you, but I've been looking for Aurora for three years, <laughs> and I want to set up an audition. Would you do it? Costa accepted the offer, and at her audition in the recording booth with George Bruins, she was asking to sing, has to sing and do a bird call, which she did initially in her southern accent, until she was advised to do an English accent. The next day, she was informed by Walt Disney that she had landed the role. This next fact is just crazy to me. Eleanor Audley initially turned down the choice role of Maleficent because she was battling tuberculosis at the time. But then she reconsidered it. Jeez. That's, like, crazy. Mm-hmm. She would, I would have been like, no, I'm going to rest. Thanks, though. <laughs> After doing some modeling as King Stefan, Hans Conrad recorded some dialogues, but he was later replaced by Taylor Holmes, which marks this film as Holmes' f- final film role. During its original release in January 1959, Sleeping Beauty grossed approximately $5.3 million in theater rentals, the distributor's share of the box office gross. Sleeping Beauty's production costs, which total $6 million, made it most expensive, the most expensive Disney film up to that point. Jeez. And over twice as expensive as each of the preceding <laughs> three Disney animated features, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, and Lady and the Tramp. The high production cost of Sleeping Beauty, coupled with the underperformance of much of the rest of Disney's 1959-1960 release slate, resulted in the company posting its first annual loss in a decade for the fiscal fiscal year of 1960. And there was massive layoffs throughout the animation department. Aurora is the only Disney princess with violet eyes. Yeah, which I didn't realize until this last time watching it on like a big TV. She's just got pretty eyes. She does. Aurora, as we stated, was the last princess created before Walt Disney's death. The clock under the Sleeping Beauty castle is stopped at 1123 and that is the exact time when Walt gave his opening day speech. That's cool. Very cool. Aurora is the princess, like we've stated, with the least amount of screen time, Mm -hmm. only appearing in the movie for 18 minutes. Wow. So that's why she doesn't have many lines, because she's not in the movie very long. And Maleficent, in Latin, means evil doing. Jeez, that's not fitting at all. It's perfect. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. For additional content, find us on Patreon. And And don't don't forget, forget, beauty is found within. within.